this morning I want to I want to talk about that. I want to show you a whole lot of pictures. I want to tell you a whole bunch of stories um, because as I've always said and will always maintain is when one goes, we all go. And I do pray and hope and will continue to create opportunities for many of you to come or go without me uh, to the mission field to see the work that we invest in. Um, But even if you're not going this time, you're still part of it. Because when one goes, we all go. And so I want to include you in what we do. I want to uh, update you on a few things and, and uh, share with you um, all that happened. Well, some of what happened. There'll be many more stories that come out, I'm sure. I want to, um, I've titled this message, uh, for those of you that want to take note of what I say, The Best Place to Be. And I've got five thoughts that I'll share with you, very simple. Today's not a day of teaching, today's a day of stories. Today's a day of just connecting with family far and wide, um, because connecting with family is the best place to be. And uh, whilst I love going, and I'm called to go, and I will continue to go and make sacrifices to do that, home is here, and this is the best place to be. Kathy says amen, the rest of you, not sure. (laughs) I want to connect this... uh, message today, the story today, and into our series, uh, engaged, and, and what we're looking at at the moment is engaged in purpose. Uh, Kathy spoke last week around engaged in purpose. Um, I apologize, I haven't got the podcast up yet. It's still a new thing, this new app, and I'm the only one that knows how to do it this week, but I'm going to fix that uh, when I'm back in my office. So you will be able to get the podcast shortly, but I, I managed to listen to it uh, while I was on the plane. Well, most of it, I fell asleep, um, which isn't a reflection on Kathy's message at all. Uh, it's a confession of, uh, of how tired I was. Um, but we've since listened to it uh, on Friday, and it was a great message, and I'll get that podcast up for you this week. But engaged in purpose, what does that mean for us? It means as a family that we are plugged in to doing what God's asked us to do. And I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about it in the context of missions. So for those of you that like... Uh, maps or like to know where it is we went, uh, the little flag on that map there indicates whereabouts in Indonesia we went to. So you fly out of Auckland for 12 hours, you land in Kuala Lumpur. Um, To make sure we didn't miss our flight, I I didn't bank them too close together. That means Phil and I had like six hours to kill in Kuala Lumpur airport uh, after a 12-hour flight with no sleep. And then we flew across into Indonesia just a couple of short flights to get where we want to go. We're based in a, in a town called Baligé in Indonesia. It's in northern Sumatra, uh, and I'll show you a whole bunch of photos about that trip. So that's where we went, and we were away in total for two weeks. These are traditional local village houses. The, tribe, the local tribe in northern Sumatra is called Batak. I've told you about them before. Uh, until about 50 years ago, these guys were cannibals. It wasn't good to be a missionary because uh, the first two that took the gospel there got eaten. And when the third guy turned up, the chief said to him, you do realize what happened to the last two guys, don't you? And he said, yes, I do, but I must come and tell you about Jesus Christ. And the chief said, well, it must be quite serious if you're coming, even though the last two got eaten. So the chief received Jesus Christ as his savior, and that was the birth of the church in Baligay. Um These are the traditional houses, and when we were there with the youth in, or the young adults in uh, July, we went for a tour through one of them. They are a raised platform house with a small hole in the corner. That's the uh, ensuite, and um, this is where they eat. This is where they cook. This is where they sleep. This is where they uh, stay out of the rain. Incidentally, the one on the right hand side there is where the church was birthed that we went to serve. So they started gathering in that house on the right hand side. It was the pastor's family home. Uh, and they gathered there until they outgrew that. Well, you can only fit about 10 in there, and then it's too cozy. Um, and so then they moved to this building, which is right next door. This is where the church met for many years, um, and uh, this is the first time I visited that site, so it was quite quite cool for me to be uh, on location there and see that. Uh, this is the church now. This is where we go. I did post this photo last Sunday on Facebook because... Uh, Just as I got up to speak on Sunday morning local time, Indonesian time, uh, you guys were preparing for your youth service here on Sunday afternoon last week. And so I asked the church in Indonesia to stand and to pray 
for the church family in New Zealand, and they were most willing to do that, and I took a photo. These guys are really into what they call selfies. Selfies, 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 it just means let's take lots of photos. So I said, you pray, I'll take selfie, and, uh, and I posted that to encourage you. And I do hope that it encourages you that the church in Indonesia pray for you continuously. This is where we meet, this is where we gather, and this is how we hang out as family. So um, this is the base, and we did quite a bit of traveling. This is the pastor and his wife, Pastor Yoss, on the right-hand side. And he's kind of like the guy that oversees the network of churches that we serve. He oversees the Bible school that we serve and teach in. And that's his wife, Ellie. And she's a powerhouse, that one. She's, uh, she's a great woman of faith. Their English is so-so. Uh, you find, after you've been there, uh, while you start talking differently, and it's broken English, it's missing words out, and I even noticed Phil started doing it after the first week. Um, he had to change his language, and because colloquialism and slang that would be common to us is very foreign to them. So when they say, would you like a cup of tea, and Phil says, no, I'm all good, they have no, no idea what that means. And so he gets a cup of tea with three sugars in it. And so he had to learn to say, no, thank you, which is very clear to them, and they understand that. But look, these guys' hearts are massive. They're huge. They just want to see people loved by the love of God. And so it's our pleasure and privilege to continue the work of North End Church with these guys. Pastor Andrew Vossen has been up there for the previous, oh, I don't know, 14 or 15 years. And so we're picking up that and continuing it, uh, and we're working with these guys. And, and I suppose now, in reflection, my, my goal is to work out, well, what does next year look like? What are the ways that we're going to continue to serve them, and what are the new ways? And God began to show Phil and I, while we were there, some new things, which was very exciting. I want to give you a scripture for today. If you're taking notes, uh, write down Titus 3 verse 14. This is the scripture that I'll come back to at the end. And this challenged me while I was away. It was just in my readings, in my daily devotional uh, readings and browsing the Bible and spending time with God, this scripture came to me. It says, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that may, they may not be unfruitful. And I'll pick this up on the end, but really what I wanted to say at the beginning is this is us as a church family continuing the good work that has been going for many, many years. We support the church network and the Bible school uh, monthly. We send them payments to to keep the operation afloat. Um, They are a very poor nation, and the people that come to church, you can see they dress up, but that's their one good outfit, and the rest of the week... Uh, not so flash. Uh, so it's a poor area. Um, and so we maintain the good works that we do when we travel. So the best place to be is the title of the message. I want to share five thoughts with you. You might want to write these five thoughts down and ponder on them to see how you might engage in purpose when uh, considering the best place to be. Obviously, on a missions trip, one of the best places you can be is sharing the love of God, but don't limit it to being overseas. You can do that at home. So the first thought that I have for you, the best place to be is sharing the love of God. We absolutely go to do that. One of the ways we did that while we were away was a village crusade. And so we traveled for two hours on a Sunday afternoon to go to the village of my translator. Her name is Derma. You'll see plenty of photos of her. Um, She's been translating for me uh, for four trips now. And... um, She has always been asking that we would travel out to her village. Her village is very poor. It's very remote. Uh, It's around the the uh, the northern side of the bay that Ballygay is on. But it's still a two-hour drive, and the last half hour is probably rocks and dirt and and bumpy roads. But they are trying to fix that. Um, There's the local kids that came out to see us. They were watching everything, and uh, they were very very keen to be part of this crusade. So we go out there, and it's all about sharing the love of God. And uh, this is their version of Case. Uh, This guy is called Ezra, and he does everything like what our Case Bouter does. He makes the sound work, he makes the lights work, he makes the cars work, he makes the building go okay. Um, And here he is. They'd set up the sound system the day before, and he had all this working. Now, you've got to understand, uh, these guys do only one volume, and it is ear-piercing. Uh, and so he makes sure that the, that the feedback is just right and the, and the, the pitch for your eardrums is just wrong. Uh, but that's how they love to worship and sing. And when they talk, it's all that loud as well. So he was doing this, and then the heavens opened. 
So we've got one power lead from a shack next door across to the sound system, and he's outside. So the poor guy had to find boxes, cardboard boxes and plastic bags to try and protect the gear. Uh, but like Case does, he just made it work. Just made it work. He's a, he's a gem, that guy. These guys set up a little tent for us. This is a crusade set up in a village. The kids all come out because they want to see what you're up to. Um, they, we, um, they put a TV thing on, the projector for them, a movie, to keep them entertained while we got ready, while they get the village people coming in. They rented these chairs and they rented this uh, roof, if you could call it that. Um, this is before it started raining. But once it started raining, it was really noisy. This is a photo at the beginning of the night, just to show you. This is the setup, um, and this is where we, we go to share the love of God. So when I go there, essentially what they want me to do is to share the gospel message to lead people to salvation and get an encounter for healing. So that's my aim. Um, they, they have a different mindset to me. They like to preach end times, and they're always getting their... Um, um, their framework for that off CNN, which I don't quite go with, but, um, but I go to preach the love of God. I go to preach that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you, that you would be drawn into a relationship with him and your life would be changed. And that's what I do. So, so we preach a message. They, they want you to preach for about an hour um, and then they have an encounter time and they have a response time. And these people flood for a response. They managed this really well um, this time. And what I loved about this, and I'm saying this, I suppose, as feedback to you and accountability for what we invest in, this is the first time that I have seen the Bible school students ministering at the altar call. And that's a fantastic milestone for us to get to. Previously, it's all been point the finger at Phil and he has to pray for everyone. He's the only one that could bring healing. And, and now we've got them to the point through the support and the training and the teaching that I've done up there with them. And they're really um, activating these guys and engaging them and drawing them into that place. Uh, while we were there in July, we missed them because they were all on outreach, practicing in the villages. Um, so it's a fantastic milestone. This time they brought the kids up for prayer. They brought them all to the front and we blessed them. There was many, many instances where you really don't know what's going on, even though you have a translator, but you're just praying and trusting God's doing His work, and God does do His work. There's a, there's a, a very amazing um, presence of God because the hunger of God is there. The other thing that we did uh, while we were there, oh, so, so after that, that was a Sunday night outreach at two hours away. We finished around 10.30, um, you know, getting the expensive gear back on the truck so it didn't get stolen and making sure we'd, we'd tidied the village as much as we could. Then you drive two hours to go to bed. And as they're dropping us off, they said, by the way, tomorrow morning we have to leave at eight, and we have to go to the prison, and you have to minister to the prisoners. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. I'm so tired right now, I'm going to sleep. And you go back into the motel, and the disco is loud, and you're thinking, how am I going to sleep here? But you go to sleep and wake up, and sure enough, the next morning, eight o'clock, they come and pick you up. And they say, we're off to the prison now. And Phil and I were like, well, we haven't had breakfast. Like, we didn't get to tell the kitchen that we were leaving early, and so you stop at the supermarket, you buy chocolate bars, muesli bars, and energy drinks, and this is the uh, sustenance of good health that you have when you're a traveling minister. So you can all be envious that we get to live the high life while we're on the road. So we travel for two hours, and, and Derma says, what are you going to speak on? Because she likes to read my notes beforehand um, so that she has an idea of what I'm doing so she can follow along. And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I'm going to have an hour's worship time, and then I'm going to tell you what that is. And so I put my headphones in, and God, God gave me a message of hope for these prisoners, which was fantastic. We turn up there. Uh, um, you can tell why they let this guy in. I'm still not sure why they let him out looking like that. But um, this is a new thing for us. We've never done this before. So this is exciting. This is a low-security prison. They didn't check our bags. Uh, we took in food parcels for every single person that came. They all got lunch, and they had a two-hour slot on a Monday morning for worship. Uh, everyone likes selfies, even the prison guards, so they took their guns off to pose with us and have selfies, and, and here we are standing outside the prison posing with the guards. As I said, really low security. Uh, this was a mixed um, gender prison, um, low walls, um, but essentially these guys are here because they all got, these people are in here because they all got in trouble. So again, we're going to share the love of God. Um, this is a, a shot of the inside of the room. Um, I, I, um, I, 
the young ones are noticing that I got a little bit jiggery in my um, portrait photo, and Pastor Yoss has got seven shoulders on the left-hand side. You can see that on the screen. Um, but apart from that, uh, the idea was to give you a, a view of the room. So we have about 40 people come for this um, time of worship and ministry. And then, of course, everyone wants photos. So, um, so what I loved about this was the hunger in people. You know, um, God was... Um, showing me, because they made me sit on the stage for the whole service with the translator, through the worship, and, through, and then obviously you minister from up there. But while I was up there, God showed me that there was a lot of darkness in that place, and that um, there was some of it we weren't to go near. Um, I think he was keeping us safe, um, particularly me, from ministering against dark forces that I didn't have permission or authority to deal with. There's um, a lot of demonic activity in, in Indonesia. Um, their traditional, even the traditional uh, people in some of the traditional churches would still follow along with sacri- ritual sacrifices and blood offerings for their ancestors. So you see massive monuments, gravestones, and shrines to their ancestors, and they believe if you honor your ancestors, it will go well for you. So at the market, you can buy chicken meat, and you can also buy chicken blood. A lot of darkness, a lot of black magic, and a lot of demonic activity. So you've got to be careful what you decide to do. So I'm there, and God says, don't do that, but you can do this. And I'm like, Okay, so we did a lot of ministry and and just really breaking off shame and condemnation from some of these people to give them hope that even though they're inside the walls, God can give them freedom. You know, we can't let them out because that's not right, but we can certainly set them free on the inside. So we pray for healing, we pray for freedom, and and we're moving along the line. I've got um, my translators with me, and we're just praying whatever God um, asks me to pray for them. And and we, we had an amazing time. So, so one of the key things there is to share the love of God with people. The second thing, as far as the best place to be goes, is the best place for you to be is at the foot of God's throne. And I must say, I, I, I'm reminded of this every time I travel, and most Sundays here, is that I can't do what I do without the grace of Jesus Christ, without my submission before His throne, that He would... He would be lifted up through the service that I offer, whether it's speaking or ministering or, or teaching. And so um, the best place you could be for your life to get your world in line with His is to be at the foot of God's throne. When it comes to um, a healing crusade, um, I've said this before, I mean, I can't, I, and I, I can't confess any cleverness or ability except for what God does or does not do. So we went to a church in Sienta. This is normally a two and a half hour drive. It took us over five hours. I'll explain why in a minute. It was a long afternoon um, and we get there. Uh, I didn't put a photo on here of the food, but they fed us really, really well. Uh, Phil had four platefuls, so it was obviously very nice food. Um, He was enjoying it, you know, baked fish and some fried chicken and some other meat, stews, curries and vegetables, rice and soup. That's pretty much what you eat up there. Then we go into the church, and they've been gathering and singing for about an hour while we eat, um, which was good for us, and I suppose okay for them. And we we, um, teach a message on the healing power of God. We talk about the love of God, how it comes to change our world, that Jesus Christ came, that we would be transformed. Most of these people are church people already. This is a, a Pentecostal church, but not so much like what we would call Pentecostal. So they're free in the spirit, they believe in it, but the pastors are still trying to catch up with what God wants to do. And so um, the church was packed to the back. The reason they asked us to come on, um, this was Saturday, right? Saturday night, um, was because they have a youth service on a Saturday night. And so there was a large number of young people in the church, which was fantastic. Um, they stay Saturday night, clean the church from top to bottom, and then sleep on the floor so that they can be there for church the next morning. So that's why they booked us in for Saturday night. The pastor was telling us over dinner that one of the areas that they need help is with the young men who are losing their minds because of the chemical substances they're abusing their bodies with. There's a new drug, or new to my knowledge, called cracker, which is a chemical compound drug that people are taking to get artificial highs, but it is opening them to the demonic realm and altering their mind and physical state. That means that they just go crazy. And this church are bringing kids in, guys and girls, but mostly guys at this stage, that they are trying to rehabilitate them off this drug. And you can see the darkness on them, um, but they're wanting freedom. And then at the end of the night... um, 
And just to tell you what it's like, at the end of the night, we go back in for a cup of tea and, a, and a, another meal, if you want one, at 10.30, and they lock one of the boys in his room, because if they don't, he gets out and he causes trouble. So this is the environment we're going into. This is the church context. Uh, we've gone there on a Saturday night for a healing crusade. These guys know how to respond. They are hungry for an encounter with God. They will, they, will, they will run to the front to meet with Jesus and have their lives changed. They want more of his grace, more of his love, and they want less of what they've got to live with. So, so it's easy to minister in this environment. Um, we, um, I normally would work with my translator, um, but there was such a response here. You can see that's her on the left in the black skirt and black jacket. She's praying for a lady, and there's me in the middle of the crowd somewhere trying to um, uh, move through people. Um, we, had a, we did have a time where we, we ended up in the same place, and there was a, a man and a woman standing there, and I'm praying for the man, and he's weeping and sobbing, and, and I can't understand what he's saying. But God just asked me to pray the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and that we would break off the condemnation, we would break off the shame, we would, we would, um, we would defeat the um, accusations of the enemy that would cause him to hate himself. And he can't understand what I'm saying, I can't understand what he's saying, but God does. And so we just watch as this man's demeanor change. At the same time, the, my translator next to me is praying for the lady who I discover afterwards is his wife. And she's praying for her, and, and she says to the wife uh, in the native tongue, again, I don't understand this, we talked about it later, she had been asking her, by word of knowledge, had been asking her to forgive her husband. And the lady said, I can't, I can't, I can't. Now what I love about this story, that I must tell you to encourage you, is my translator, Derma, has worked with me for four trips, so I only met her last October. But since then, because she is so close to me and working alongside me, she has grown immensely in her spiritual authority, the gifts operating in her, and her ability to minister to others. And she's only managed that because she's been willing to allow God to work His freedom in her life. And so one time I'm up there teaching, and I'm teaching the Holy Spirit stuff, like School of the Spirit that you guys get every month here. I do it once a year for them. And she's in the middle of translating. She breaks down with a howl and a scream and crumbles to the floor in tears. And I'm like, oh, I guess we're having a break. <laughs> and so we pick her up off the floor, and the others come, and we minister to her, and, and something broke in her that day, and she got set free. Well, since then... She now moves in power and authority when we minister alongside each other. And occasionally I'll just say to her, this is your one. Because I know she's carrying the answer, not me. So anyway, I tell you that to say she's working with this, this lady, asking her to forgive her husband, and the lady's saying, no, I won't, I won't, I won't. So we keep ministering. She's ministering in her language to the, what is the wife, and I'm ministering in my language, English, to the, the man who doesn't understand me. And we keep ministering, and then we get them to hold hands. And by the time we had finished with this couple... She had forgiven him. They were hugging with joy, and God was blessing them and, and, and ministering to them with the spirit of reconciliation. So there's real encounters that go on here. Um, sometimes you don't know what's happening. Um, a lady comes forward and is crying, and so often I'll ask my translator to, to ask the question, why are you crying? Because then that might give me a clue, or it might give me some keys to help them uh, to unlock what they're carrying. Like I said before, one of the best places for us to be is at the foot of the throne of grace. This mother was standing at the altar at the end of the night, and we spent considerable time with her. And the little girl, her daughter, I guess is about 12, is standing in front of her, and they're both crying and sobbing. We're praying and releasing the love of God. And, and then I ask Derma, you can see her there in the mustard-colored shirt with the black jacket, I say, ask them why they're crying. And the mother tells the story that when the daughter was being born, there was difficulty, and so they had pulled the daughter out of the mother by her left arm, which was now limp from the shoulder down. She couldn't lift it. It was just like this. And so I absolutely, passionately believe that Jesus Christ wants to bring healing to that girl's arm that she would not feel the shame or condemnation of the people who laugh at her at school, 
that her mother would not live in the condemnation that it's her fault that this happened, and that this family would be a testimony to the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we believe? Isn't that what the Bible says? Isn't that what we should expect every time we come before him in the the throne of grace that he sits on? I don't even know this girl's name. And uh, we for whatever reason, we didn't get to see her lift her arm by herself. But I'm not going to stop praying for her. And I'd ask that you pray for her too. I don't know her name. You could make up a name. If you're praying for her, God knows who you're praying for. The city she lives in is Sienta. She's a girl with a limp right arm. And I think of her often. I can't explain why God didn't heal her when he chose to heal other people. But what it confirms to me is there's no other place for us to be but at the foot of the throne of God. It's the only place. It's the only place where we should be on our knees. And you know what? It's him that chooses what happens, not me. I can petition God. I can plead God. I don't need to beg him. But I can believe that he has done everything necessary for her healing. And that it's all about his timing and his grace. It's humbling. It's obviously, you can tell it's, it's a burden I carry. It's a, something that is, is it's troubling me in that I want her free. I want her healed. And I'll continue to believe for it. We've got to stay at the foot of God's throne. The third place that's the best place for you to be is connected to kingdom family. So we went, uh, one of the reasons I go in October, the key reason I go this time of year is because they have their annual pastors conference. Um, And so this time there was a mix up and a confusion and the two other speakers that were supposed to go did not go. So in two days I did five teaching sessions that I didn't know I was going to do. So while I was there, I wrote nine or 10 different messages in the 10 days that I was on the ground. So we did lots of teaching and ministry over the two days with the pastors. These pastors come from as far far away as Timor. They took more flights to get there than we did. But I would say this, I'd say thank you to North End Church because we subsidize this conference and we pay for half of it in partnership with another church. And there was a huge bunch of them that came. Uh, One church brought 21 of its people, including Bible college students and intern, what what we would call an intern, Some of them traveled from Sosa for 10 hours on a bike, motorbike, not push bike. Uh, Pastor Charles and his crew came from Batu Roka, that is 14 hours drive by car. And they left on the Monday just before we did, and they were trying to pack their car because they had 15, um, five motorbikes and a little SUV thing. And they were heading off for the day, and they weren't going to stop till they got home. Well, they would stop for food. Um, But this is why we go, and this is Kingdom Family. This is the church that we're connected with in Baligay. There's about 20-plus churches in the network of churches. There's pastors. Uh, Pastor Ada is um, down in uh, Timor. And I said, tell me about your church. What's your church like? She says, we meet in my home, and there are two ladies and their children that come. I said, great. When I talked to Pastor Reuben, who um, unfortunately him and his wife just lost a baby, uh, stillborn, and I say, tell me about your church, and this is a church that we've paid rent for as a, as a, as a missions expense, and um, he says, well, I used to have 12, there was many families that would come, but I spa- started teaching on purity, and half of them left. 
the big combat over there is that they want religion, they don't want a pure faith. But we invest in them. We invest in them. So the pastors' conference is is an apostolic conference. These guys are part of the apostolic churches globally, um, of which we are part of. They ask me to teach on apostolic ministry while I'm there. So this year I taught four keys for apostolic ministry. What does it take for us, every single one of us, to be a minister of God's love, grace, and power? So teach them that. And then every session we have an altar call. Every session they respond. Every session God's ministering to them and filling them up with his love and his power. Pastor Adrianus, who's down in Kupang, he said to me at the end, there's tears in his eyes. He says, I am so full of God's love and Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming. Thank you for teaching us and thank you for giving us what you carry. And they're so grateful. And so I'm saying this to you to say thank you to you for allowing us to go, for, 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 for freeing us from here in order that we can minister over there. You know, it takes a team to run this church when I'm not here. And I'm really grateful that we have got the ability to see it continue even though one's gone. You know, one of the other pastors said to me in town, he says, man, you're never at home. How does your church survive? So, man, if my church had to survive with me alone, I'd be in trouble. I'm so grateful I've got a team, I've got a church that picks up the, 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 the roles and, and, and functions and responsibilities necessary. You know, the, the testimonies I heard last week online about the youth service on Sunday night blew me away. I was so delighted to hear that there was over 80 people in here jumping up and down worshipping and that the whole service was led by our youth. It's fantastic. That's inspiring. And it's great because I don't have to be here to make it happen. It happens anyway. And that's empowering and liberating. One of the things that was awesome um, at the end of the conferences, they asked me to minister to each church group that was present and prophesy God's new promises for the season to come. And many of them are planting new churches in the forest, the sugarcane plantations. Many of them are going to do evangelism in remote villages on their scooters. I saw a photo on Facebook this week uh, of um, Pastor Pulu and Merson, who are the couple that we sponsored to go down to a remote island in Timor. And they are literally getting, pulling, scraping the mud off their motorcycle wheels because they're going out to a remote village in a rainstorm. That's what they do. And so we bless them and we minister to them. And this is the group from Baligay, the head base, where the Bible school is. And and what God said to some of these church networks is exciting. We should be very excited about the next season explosion that's going to happen in Indonesia with the grace and outpouring of God's love. The other thing that we partner with that I told you I was going to do was Hope School. So Hope Village is the orphanage base that we support where we took a team in July and we're able to minister uh, to the kids there. There are currently 64 kids on site um, in the orphanage and we're a part of the support for that. Um, What was really exciting this time is uh, a young man called Genius, that's his name, Genius, has just graduated from university in Madan, and he's come back to Hope. So he was an orphan in the tsunami that wiped out Nias Island. He got rescued into Hope Village at a, at a young age. He spent the last 10 years in Hope Village getting strengthened and taught. He's been to high school, and now he's gone to university. He's graduated university, and he's come back as the operations support for Hope Village. So how's that for a cycle? building opportunities and empowering people. The reason that we went to Hope School, this is just God's timing. This was planned for the Friday of my day off while I was there, and it was the commissioning celebration service for the building, the foundation stone for the brand new junior high school building that they're building. So these guys have 340 kids on site five days a week in a Christian school in the largest Muslim nation in the world. 340 kids. And now they've got enough money to start building their junior high school so that the kids can continue their education in a Christian environment. This is a fantastic thing. And we partnered with this. So we just happened to be there on the day that they were having the service. So we go there. It's raining. There's the kids all lined up from the junior school. 
They sang songs. They did dances. These are the founders. Mike on the right-hand side there um, with the white shirt and his wife, Anne, they founded Hope Village 14 years ago when God broke their heart to see the orphans after the tsunami. Uh, That's Mr. Potter on the left-hand side. Uh, He is the operations manager on-site guy that runs the the village uh, 24-7 all year. Um, So like I said, the kids did traditional dances and songs. There was a couple of worship songs we sang. Um, The kids did a dance uh, to uh, show us how how much joy they had um, at the um, at the new opening. So there's the dance and lots of colour, and then they put a Bible in the foundation stone. So that someone asked, why do they do that? Well, this is it's just basically a symbol of building their organisation on the Word of God. So they believe God is their provider. They believe God is the reason they're doing this. And so every new building that they build, they dig a hole and they plant a Bible in the bottom of the hole. They put stones on it and they cement it over. And if you follow Hope Village on Facebook, you'll see they now have got the foundation stones laid. The building is mapped out and they're ready to start building. They build a house on site for the builders because they live there and they will construct the building in line with um, the same um, buildings that are already at Hope Village. So it's super exciting to be there, guys. And this is, this is part of our kingdom family, Hope Village. These are the people we're connected with. These are the people that we support. These are the children that we pray for. This is the organization that is bringing transformation to local society because they're bringing education with Christian values into Indonesia. So we should be excited about that. The fourth place to be, the best place you can be, is on your knees in prayer. I would like to say thank you very much for praying for us while we were gone. You, uh, your prayers are um, are needed. You know, as I've alluded to while we're over there, we they work us hard. Um, One of the things that I've learned from this trip is I need to be really careful about what I allow them to schedule and how much they ask me to do. Because at the end of the trip, I had nothing. I was empty. I was a wreck. Um, I need to think about the formation of teams. I need to take people that can do different things along the way. We met uh, a missions team from Pastor Joseph Prince's church from Singapore. New Creation Church are partnering with Hope School now. And they send 40 teams out a year from their church. Now, this is a church of 30,000. Big church. They send 40 teams a year. Every team has its own translator, wherever they go. Every team has its own medical person, wherever they go. Every team has a security person in case things go bad. Every team has their own cook. Every team has their own leader, and every team then has the people that do the work. Now, we don't have 30,000 people, but what I've learned from that is that I've got to take a team that can carry different responsibilities, not just me. And so I, I would look forward to you helping me with that. Um, but your prayers are coveted. What, what you see on Facebook is not all of the reality that's going on. Um, there were certain things that were happening behind the scenes uh, while we were there that we could have got into quite a bit of trouble if you guys weren't praying for us at home. There's always stuff that goes on at home when we're away. Family stuff, relational stuff, church stuff. And your prayers are absolutely essential. Like I said at the beginning, when one goes, we all go. We're all part of this. And if you're not on a trip, you're part of a trip because of your prayers. And so the best place for you to be, whether you're there or here, is on your knees in prayer. It's, it's vital. And if we don't maintain that, then we're sending people into a dangerous environment where something bad is going to happen. Prayer really matters. This is Phil doing what Phil loves best. If you can see in that photo, I'm not sure if you can, but that's an auto parts store. So Phil in Sienta is there with the translator and Pastor Yoss buying car parts. Why? Because that's what he does. He's really good at it. And he was amazed at the access to parts and the price of the Toyota parts that were available in this place. 
But unfortunately, the reason we were buying parts is because we had a car accident. I said to you that we traveled to Siantar. It's a two and a half hour trip. It took us over five hours to get there. And one of the reasons was we had a car accident on the way. Now, thankfully, because of your prayers, it wasn't a serious accident. It was low speed. The driver, who you can see in the middle there, locked up the brakes in the rain and couldn't move the direction of the vehicle. And we hit a truck that was stationary, a big truck. And it smashed the whole front, right, right front corner of the car, crumpled the bonnet, ripped the bumper, and um, it could have been a lot worse. Your prayers are really vital. They're really, really vital. Because we could have had a high speed impact. I mean, there are vans and buses driving, uh, and unless you've been in Asia, you don't understand that toot means I'm coming, not please can I insert myself into the traffic. It just means I'm here. And, and they do it at high speed. And there's kids on scooters, there's adults on scooters, there's some families on scooters. Six to a scooter is okay. And, and it's dangerous. And so we could have had a much worse outcome. Uh, praise God we didn't. And so you're, what I'm saying is your prayers are really, really important. Really important. Um, this is an embarrassing photo, but the reason I put it up here is because um, at the end of the trip, both Phil and I got quite sick. Uh, I got some form of food poisoning, I think. I can't quite isolate how it happened, except that I know that uh, it was one of those nights where you thought you, thought, you, thought you were going to die, but you knew you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> but let me tell you, it wasn't very comfortable. And I need your prayers when I'm in that space. It's also a good reason why you don't share rooms when you travel to Asia. This is us on the way home. Um, but, you know, I just, I need to tell you this because this is the reality of the trips we go on. You know, I did, I did 10 or 11 engagements in eight days. None of that was really prepared before I went because of the workload here. And as you, as you've heard, some nights you get home at one in the morning and you're on the road by eight the next day to travel three hours to a different place for ministry. I made things worse for myself on the last day. Um, God had begun to speak to me about several of the people that work in the base that had served us in the Bible school and the church. And so I, without thinking about it, because I want to love these guys when I'm there, I said, hey, let's have a time tonight before I go where we pray and encourage and prophesy over each person that's been serving us. Sounds like a good idea, eh? I mean, that's what we do. So we had dinner. Uh, This is Sunday night before we come home. So last Sunday afternoon. We have the dinner, and I'm waiting, and no one's there, and they're, they're all fussing around, and I'm like, well, are we going to do this or not? So we're chatting, and Phil and I are really tired, and we're like, maybe we're just going to bed, you know, it's 8.30, quarter to 9. At 9 o'clock, they all turn up, 24 of them, wanting personal words of encouragement and prophecy. So what do you do? You give it to them. You love them, because that's what God would ask you to do. And, and the only way that I can sustain that is because I've got a family at home praying for me. So thank you. Thank you very much for the way that you prayed for us, the way that you encouraged us, and the way that you continue to support those who end up on these kinds of trips. Finally, number five, the best place for you to be is to be positioned as part of God's solution. Each one of us can be a part to this. While I'm there, while we were there, we saw quite a lot. Phil uh, what was great having Phil there who had never been before is he could make different observations uh, than I would make. Because I'm there, I'm familiar with some of it, and I don't see everything that other people see. So he, he starts to notice things, and we've picked up a few things that um, might be new innovations and developments for the way that we minister over there. One of the things that's being proven to be successful is the equipping of people and the grace that our church carries to do that. And so we've started to to look for how we can develop a training center there in partnership with the Bible school. But more than that, to equip people to sustain their families. So training them in practical trades or services, helping them to get off the poverty line and earning an income for their family beyond the 42 cents a day that most of them live on. So that's something that we're going to pray into as a church and... um, to buy the piece of land next door to the church, for instance, 500 square meters, 
is um, under 15,000 New Zealand dollars. I'm like, why the heck don't we just go and do that? To buy the section at the front that's on the lakefront, half an acre, 100,000 New Zealand dollars. That's quite expensive per acre. Um, but if we go into town and you don't get a view of the lake, you can buy a three-story building, 400 square metres on its own title, and um, that's 100,000. Well, we could build a training centre in there. So these are the things that we come home with and the, the questions that we've got to ask as a church around what we're going to do. Every one of us can be part of God's solution. I want to say thank you. As a church, we invested into the needs in Kopang, which is down in Timor. I talked about that earlier this year. We were able to respond and bless them with financial gifts because of your generosity, above and beyond the normal missions program that we support. So this is uh, maintain good works and then meet needs. So we were able to respond to that. What we learned more there, I don't know if you remember, I showed you a photo of Pulu and Merson who were being sent as graduates down to oversee the church, five churches down in Timor. And they had a need for rent for somebody to live. Do you remember that? And we had a need for the legal costs for the church land. Um, and we had a need for a motorbike. Well, a couple of people pitched up to help out, a group of people, and we got some of those needs met. Well, the money that we sent them for the rent um, didn't quite land as rent. Let me explain. So they get this money, and we give them enough to b- p- pay two years' rent on a house, which will become a church base. And they're looking, and they're looking, and they're looking, and they can't find something suitable. And they're like, God, what, what do you want us to see that we cannot see? And they go to look at this other house, and it turns out that the government down there have an incentive to help people own property, and the money, instead of paying for two years' rent, is a deposit on owning a house in Timor that the church now is paying for. So our gift didn't just rent a house, we bought a house. How good is that? That's fantastic. So we're sustaining them, um, and, or sorry, we're kicking them off, but then they're going to be able to sustain it. That's brilliant. Fantastic. So they wanted me to say, come home and say thank you. Thank you for your partnership. Thanks for your support. Thanks for your continued help. While I was there, I gave them some money from the church to help pay for the car parts. But I'd really like to send them some money to pay the panel beaters bill. And if you're in a position to help out, then I'd love for you to come and uh, see me or just uh, message the office. I have got no response forms for today. Uh, I I'm not that organized. But the panel beater's got the car, and he's having to um, shift the radiator. He's having to straighten a few things. Phil had a good look at it. It's okay, but it's, skin, it's not cheap. And so if you, if you think you could give $100 towards that, you know, if 20 families gave 100 bucks, there's 2,000 New Zealand dollars. That's, oh, that's 20 million local dollars that we could send them. That's amazing, you know, and that would change their world. Um, so... Have a think. If God's talking to you, then come and see one of us afterwards. I want to tell you a story about Nias Island. Nias Island is off the west coast of northern Sumatra. I visited that place two years ago to see the work that we invest in down there. There's three or four churches with a church plant happening. And I went to visit the church of a local pastor whose name I can't remember or pronounce anyway. So, um, And they had asked us if we would invest in rebuilding their church for them. And at the time, I'm like, why would we do this? You've got a church building. And I didn't really catch it. And so we didn't invest in that program. Well, they've come back to us and they've said, hey, our church have come together and we've built the bricks and done the work and we're 80% finished. Would you be able to help us to finish the project now that we've done most of it? And they need about 10 million local dollars for that, which is 1,000 New Zealand dollars. It's not much. It's not a lot. So we're going to look as a church and see what we can do, but I'm inviting you to be part of it. If you'd like to give a special one-off gift to missions in Indonesia, then contact the office or contact me and let me know you're doing that, or let the church office know that you're doing that so we can put that money aside to go where it's supposed to go. You know, for, for, for that, those kind of numbers, if you think 30 families in our church gave 100 bucks, we would nail that in one go for both those needs. I'll leave that with you. But the reason I felt to leave it with you is because of Paul's instruction to Titus as a leader of a church. He says, let our people, the believers, let our believers know 
that they must maintain good works. Let's keep giving to missions. We have a monthly missions giving program. If you're part of that, I want to say thank you. You can track how we're going in the newsletter each month. I do the graph and update it to make sure that we're on track because we've got partners overseas in India and Indonesia and abroad um, and some local that count on our support. So let's maintain the good works that we do. But let us also not neglect the need to meet urgent needs. Let's respond. Let's, let's respond to what God's stirring in our heart. Make a sacrifice in order that we could support them. Don't miss the warning Paul gives here. Let our people learn that they may not be unfruitful. Paul's saying to the church and to the church leaders that part of the fruitfulness of your life is the generosity of your life. So as I close, it's best, the best place for us to be is engaged in purpose, plugged in to what the family of God are doing and the purposes of God, that we would work together as kingdom family across the world and be a part of the good news of Jesus Christ, the practical love demonstrated by practical means. I want to thank you, each and every one of you, for your, um, your commitment and prayer and encouragement uh, and, and for your financial partnership, because it is making a difference. As we go over there, Phil and I have had a, you've had a good trip. We've seen a lot of things, we've learned a lot, and it, I can really say that it was fruitful. The ministry times were powerful, the teaching times um, by what they tell us were incredibly helpful, uh, so that we have, we can be certain that we've done a good thing while we're there. Why don't you stand and we'll close. I'd uh, reiterate Kathy's invitation to say, please stay. Please stay for a cup of tea or a real coffee and uh, some food. The team out there have prepared uh, some food, some snacks for a time of fellowship. Please connect with other people. Find some people. Touch base, catch up, share some stories. Um, if you have been uh, challenged by God to commit to financial partnership for the needs I shared, then please make sure you talk to one of the leaders or contact the church office. That would be much appreciated. Let me pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we can come together as family and be engaged in purpose. Lord, this morning we celebrate the good work that's happening in Indonesia. We celebrate the lives that you are continuing to change as you continue your work there by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless the church leaders and their people as they are on the ground, ministering in God's love. We lift up those ministers who have been at the conference that this Sunday as they gather, they will be filled with the fire and power of the Holy Spirit. And whether they've got two or 200 in their church, that you would lead them in a way that would bring life and freshness to the people of God that they serve. Father, we lift up those who have a healing need over there. Lord, I think of the little girl whose name I don't know and her limp right arm. We continue to petition you for a practical outworking of the healing power of Jesus Christ, that her life would be transformed and that her testimony would be that Jesus heals. Only you can do that, God. And we humble ourselves at the foot of your throne of grace, asking for that miracle. Father, stir our hearts when it comes to generosity. Stir our hearts to meet needs. Whatever the gift size, we want to bring one that's obedient to your promptings. And now as we go, Lord, would you give us a revelation of the love of God, our Father, that's far and wide, so big and expansive that nothing can overcome it or stop it. Father, would you give us a walking revelation of the grace of Jesus and the power and freedom that each one of us has access to because of his surrender and his victory? And would we know how close you are, God, to us through your Holy Spirit each and every day, that we would walk in confidence in the relationship we can have with you. As one friend talks to another, God, may we talk to you. May we hear your voice. May we know your leading. May we know your reassurance. And may we know your empowerment that we would be your voice piece to other people who need to see and hear how much you love them. God, I bless our church family. 
for those away traveling this weekend, for those on holiday and family time. Lord, that the blessing of God is rich and that no sorrow is added with it, that we would truly know we are your children. God, I bless the church in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, have a great week. Uh, Wherever you go, whatever you do, have a great week. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Eric.